Hey guys, and welcome to the Moms and Mysteries podcast, a true crime podcast featuring myself, Mandy, and my dear friend, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Mandy. How are you? I am doing fabulous. How Ooh. are you? I like that. I am doing quite well. Um, before we recorded tonight, my son looked at me and said, do you ever wonder if you're a real person and everyone around you is a robot? Yes. And then, <laughs> right, but just went on with his day. I'm like, that's deep, my friend. <laughs> like, yes, I, think that, I do wonder that. <laughs> right? I have real thoughts like that, which make me feel absolutely out of my mind. But I'll be driving and be like, nobody else is even thinking in their cars. I have a million thoughts going in my head because everyone else is a robot. Is that narcissism? I don't know because, you know, I've actually seen like TikToks and Instagram reels and stuff that kind of are about this where it'll be like somebody's like filming while they're in like an airport or a train station or like a really busy place and it'll just be like there's no way everybody here is real. So like I feel like other people have the same experience where they like kind of feel like some part of life is like a simulation in some yes. way or like that or like my son calls the kids call them npcs like, like oh, it's like the that's like thing the where new... they like kind of do that weird <laughs> rotate <laughs> right, thing right. i've seen those on tiktoks too those are on people's lives all the time you see somebody just going yeah okay, okay. yeah and like Ooh, you're broken <laughs> yeah so anyway uh i don't know i feel like it's normal but i don't, don't know you if think it's normal. that's what the other robot people would say that of course it too <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I'm back to square one. I'm not a robot. Everyone else is. And clearly, I think highly of myself that an entire world was created just for me. What about me, Melissa? Do you think I'm a robot? Honestly, Am I, I just a robot know. in your robot world? <laughs> Everyone's a robot in a robot. I'm not a Barbie girl. I'm a robot girl. <laughs> I don't think you're a robot, Mandy. I'm not a robot. And the way I know that, I don't know that for sure, but I'm going to hope for the best. <laughs> And if we're robots, let's be the best robots we can be. Before we get started, we are working on our campaign still with Fall Line and Season of Justice. And if you would like to take part in that, you can visit givebutter.com slash fallmoms, F-A-L-L-M-O-M-S. If you give $25 or more, we give you a shout out on the show. And for every $5 you donate, you also have your name entered for a chance to win a Cosmo smartwatch i did all that by memory um you can also text mom soj to five three five 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 and you can also donate that way in the meantime mandy would do you want to hear a few names of people that have donated this week before we get started yes first up is rose george she's so sweet she wrote us on our moms and mysteries email account as well to say that she had donated and she was so excited to help and we really appreciate her thank you rose thank you rose aaron r we don't get aaron's last name but we know that she is serious about (laughs) helping and donating and we appreciate it so much next up an oldie but a goodie one of our faves jennifer garner we love jen garner Yeah, we're not taking any further questions. She's the only Jen Garner (laughs) that counts to us. So it doesn't matter that maybe you've heard of another one. This is the one we're we're counting today. And the last one is Dana Lewis. Dana is our friend over on Instagram and Patreon. And she's always commenting and continuing the conversation for us. And she's just really wonderful. And we just are so appreciative that all you guys contributed to the campaign. And we have just a couple more weeks left of that. And just thank you so, so much. All right, so we have a wild, wild story this week. It's wild from start to finish, truly. Um, Even the end part is just as crazy as the beginning. So being behind bars can provide the opportunity for a person to really reflect upon their wrongdoings and turn their life around. Sometimes that is the case. But unfortunately, not everyone who goes to jail capitalizes on that opportunity. And instead, some people actually go the opposite direction, Melissa, and... They plan future crimes while they're actively serving time for past ones. Sounds like one way to pass the time. Probably not the best way to pass the time in jail. Probably not. (laughs) When Donna Roberts first met Nate Jackson while she was working at a restaurant, sparks flew. Even though Nate was 28 years younger than her, they couldn't keep themselves from developing a romantic connection. And this beautiful love blossomed. Just kidding. That's not exactly the way it went. Not long after their fateful introduction, Nate got in some trouble with the law after being caught receiving stolen property, and he was sent off to prison, where he spent the majority of the year 2001. 
But that wasn't even the biggest hurdle for this blossoming new romance. The biggest hurdle was the fact that Donna was actually already in a relationship with somebody else, a man named Robert Fingerhut. Robert was a single father when he first met Donna in Florida in August of 1983. They hit it off and were quickly married, but they actually got legally divorced in May of 1985, so that was not very long into their marriage. But the couple remained in a committed relationship, even though on paper they were legally divorced. They said that this divorce was for financial and business purposes, but they still acted as though they were in fact married. Robert was a very successful businessman who wanted to protect and really shelter his assets in the event that his business collapsed or got sued. At some point before 1999, the couple settled in a home on Fond du Lac Drive in Howland Township, Ohio. Robert bought two Greyhound bus terminals in the area and started operating them. One of these stations was in Warren, Ohio, and the other was in Youngstown. The Youngstown location had a restaurant inside of it, and Donna was in charge of managing that restaurant. The Greyhound assets and almost all of the couple's other assets were also listed in Donna's name. Even though all of this really would have made for an easy out if Donna was looking to end the relationship that she had with Robert, instead she chose to enter into this affair with Nate Jackson. And even after Nate had to go spend some time in jail, Donna wanted to continue the affair. After spending nearly a year in prison, Nate was released on December 9th, 2001. And that night, he and Donna celebrated together in a jacuzzi suite at the Wagon Wheel Motel in Youngstown. Then, on December 12th at 12.01 a.m., not even two days after Nate had been released from jail, Donna's husband Robert was reported dead. When officers arrived at Robert and Donna's home, they found Robert's lifeless body in the kitchen lying face down on the floor near the door to the garage. An autopsy later performed by the deputy coroner, Dr. Humphrey Germanick, determined that Robert had sustained lacerations and abrasions to his left hand and his head, as well as three gunshot wounds one to the head, one perforating wound that went into the right side of his back and through his chest, and one that grazed the right side of his back. It was determined that the gunshot wound to the head was fatal. A fully loaded thirty-eight caliber revolver was found near Robert's body, along with a bloody shoe print. The bullets collected from Robert's body and the ones collected at the crime scene were determined to have been fired from the same gun, but they did not match the gun that was actually found at the scene. They were fired from another gun. Donna stated that she was at work on December 11th and that when she got off at 5.30, she went and had dinner by herself at Red Lobster before she went home. She said that Robert had called and told her that he'd be getting home late that night and suggested that Donna just go shopping. Donna said she left home around 9 p.m. and went to several stores, which I think there might be too open, so... I feel like we've heard something similar in another story we've done because it kind of gave me like a little sense of deja vu that there was another story where like the lady had said she was out shopping, but it was at like 10 p.m. And we're like, where were you shopping? It was a.m. It was like 8, 9 a.m. It was earlier in the morning. It might have even been 7, but it was like before shops really open. And so this is the opposite of that, I think. Yeah. So when Donna got home just before midnight after allegedly shopping, she found Robert lying on the floor and bleeding from his head. Robert's car was also missing from their house. Donna's overall emotional state at this time was kind of up and down. She'd be calm and quiet at times, and then she would have these outbursts and start screaming and crying. And one example of this was uh, there were two detectives on the scene that noticed that Donna seemed to really quiet down when there were two officers having this extensive conversation with each other. So Obviously, if you're being quiet, you could hear other things a little bit better. So I think that's kind of what they were they were hinting at. So when they would go to check on her, because she had gone quiet, she would then really start wailing again. But one officer said he never noticed any tears actually coming from Donna's eyes while she was acting like she was crying. Eventually, Donna's brother was called to come pick her up while officers continued to search and secure the scene and gather evidence. Before Donna left the house... A detective told Donna that the house was a crime scene and the police needed to search the house and everything in it, which included the garage and the cars. And Donna replied, quote, do whatever you have to do to catch the blank, end quote. So a few hours later at 3.38 a.m., investigators were still at the house doing their job when the phone at Robert and Donna's house rang. A detective answered the call, but after a short pause, the caller hung up. 
When the detective had the call traced, they found that it came from Donna's cell phone. Later on that morning at around 10 o'clock, Donna was visited by a detective at her brother's home. She gave them written consent to continue searching her house, and she agreed to meet with them later at the police station for an interview. Donna said that she and Robert had a loving relationship, but she said that they each kind of did their own thing. The way she put it was that they were a quote-unquote cool couple. Ooh. We're not really sure what that <laughs> means. Um, the way she was talking, it kind of was insinuating that they may have had an open relationship, but we don't really know that maybe just what she was trying to, the story that she was trying to kind of go with. So Donna alleged that Robert was actually attracted to both women and men and that he had this special friend named Bobby. And so she said that Robert had been acting, in her words, kind of nutty, and she believed that the relationship with Bobby had something to do with it. Donna further admitted to herself having an ongoing sexual relationship with another man named Carlos, and she said this had been going on for about six months. She also had another friend named Santiago who ended up stealing money and a gun from her, apparently, uh, after she had tried to take measures to help him in some way. I guess she didn't bother to report that to the police. Donna told the police that she didn't have relationships with anyone else. But when she was asked about Nate Jackson, suddenly she was like, oh, yeah, I forgot about him. I've actually been dating <laughs> Nate for two years. <laughs> okay. <laughs> She then told them that they had also been exchanging these calls and letters while he had been in prison for part of the two years that they had been dating. She mentioned how she actually had just picked Nate up from jail a couple days ago on December the 9th, and she took him to a house in Youngstown and left him there, and she hadn't seen him since. She did admit to actually speaking on the phone to him on the morning of December 11th, but again, said she hasn't seen him. Crazy to me that she didn't think any of that was important until the police mentioned his name. Right. When they asked Donna if she had a cell phone and, you know, if they could just take a look at it, she told them that she actually left it at home. And they ended up telling her that they actually knew somebody had used her cell phone to call her house at 3.38 in the morning. And when Donna learned this, she told them that it must have been Nate because he was always borrowing her phone. Robert's car was soon found abandoned in Youngstown, approximately three blocks from where Nate was staying. Investigators searched the car and found blood in multiple areas inside of it. Blood was collected from the visor and the trunk release lever inside the car, and both were later confirmed to be a mixture of DNA from two people, and those two people were Robert and Nate. From there, police started digging into Donna and Nate and the nature of their relationship, and that's when the story really started to unfold. And we have so much more to get into after a quick break to hear a word from this week's sponsors. So before the break, we were talking about Robert Fingerhut, his wife Donna, and her recent admission to having an affair with this man named Nate, and whose DNA was also found in Robert's car. So through looking at records and speaking with witnesses and those who knew Donna, it was learned that she was seen talking to Nate on the afternoon of December 10th at the Greyhound bus terminal shortly before Robert arrived for work that day. Later, the same employee who saw Donna and Nate also said they overheard Donna asking her husband Robert for $3,000, which he apparently refused to give her. This witness also said that Donna was nervous and shaky and allegedly gave Robert the dirtiest look you could imagine. So the next day, December 11th, a bus driver actually saw Robert walking alone at the Youngstown Terminal at about 4.35 p.m., the bus driver then proceeded on his normal route to the Warren bus terminal, where he just so happened to see Donna with another man. The man identified himself as Nathaniel. The bus driver said that Nathaniel, who we know as Nate, and Donna appeared to be in some kind of a hurry to leave. As 6 p.m. approached, the pair were seen and served by a waitress at Red Lobster. Keep in mind, Donna did admit to going to Red Lobster, but she said she was by herself. So they paid their bill at 6.43 p.m. and left the restaurant. At 9 p.m., Robert left the bus terminal and said goodbye to the security guard on his way out. He said that he was going to be going home. At around 9.30, a neighbor saw Donna driving very slowly in the neighborhood, even though no one else was even on the road. They found out through phone records that Donna's cell phone was used to make a number of calls between 9.45 and 11.44 p.m. that night. They also found a second cell phone in Donna's car that she never bothered to mention. 
So shortly after 11.30 p.m., Donna showed up at the Days Inn Motel in Boardman and reserved a room for one week. Nate ended up staying in that room for a period of time. Police went to the Days Inn room and found bloodstains. They also recovered a garbage bag that had been in the room, and this bag contained a nearly empty bottle of hydrogen peroxide and bloodstained bandages and gauze. The DNA of the blood was later determined to be consistent with Nate's DNA profile. Fingerprints lifted from inside the room and from a Days Inn room key envelope marked with the room number matched Nate's fingerprints. It was later found out that Donna was the one to purchase the peroxide and the bandages at Walgreens. The real jackpot of evidence was found at Donna's house, namely 145 letters and cards that had been handwritten by Nate to Donna, and she had saved every last one of them. They also found a brown paper bag with Nate's name on it in the trunk of Donna's car that was parked inside her garage, and inside of that bag were some clothes and 139 other letters that were written by Donna to Nate, dated from October through early December 2001. So we're talking about like two months of time, and they have sent 139 letters like plus back and forth to each other. That's yeah. like absolutely crazy. The police also found an empty box that is f- was for handcuffs inside the trunk. Obviously, we are not going to read all of the letters that these two sent back and forth to each other, but there were a couple of really important and relevant ones, such as the ones that specifically mentioned Robert. For example, on October 2nd, 2001, Nate wrote to Donna, why don't you leave Robert and let's carry on with a world of our own? Or let me do what I was going to do to him because you know that that was our little thing. So you better not go and try to get no one else to do it because I told you it's getting done when I come home, end quote. On October 8th, Nate wrote, Donna, I got it already planned out on how we're going to take care of the Robert situation. And baby, it's the best plan ever because Donna, it's now time that we really be together so that we can really see the true side of our love because I'm tired of not being able to be with you. A couple of weeks later, Nate wrote that he didn't care what Donna had to say. Robert had to go, and he wasn't going to let her stop him this time. Donna wasn't really exactly even doing anything to try and stop him. She wasn't doing anything to talk him out of it. If anything, she was only adding fuel to the fire in the letters that she was sending back to him. In mid-October, she complained to Nate about how Robert was starting to pay more attention to her spending, and he had been giving her a budget of $100 a week and wouldn't allow her to use any of her 52 credit cards. Could you repeat that number? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, if I had 52 credit cards, I think my husband would probably tell me to chill out also. (laughs) Yeah, no, I feel like that's pretty reasonable. (laughs) Yeah. So she then wrote to Nate, quote, do whatever you want to him ASAP, amen, end quote. In response, Nate replied, quote, hey, Donna, just think, come 12 11 one you'll be waking up to me, or maybe we'll give it a couple of days to let things look cool, and then after the funeral, baby, when I come home, I'm never leaving, and we're only doing it like that just to make it look good. All I need is for my baby not to worry and leave everything else up to me. Uh, Donna, I think you should worry quite a bit. This is a terrible plan. (laughs) And my gosh, to put all this stuff in writing, I'm glad they did. But to be such a great plan, I feel like this step got missed. Right. In other letters, Robert had the audacity to ask if Donna would buy him a 2002 Cadillac DeVille after he killed her husband, Robert, and he also provided her with a list of things that he would be needing for the murder that he wanted Donna to go ahead and acquire. Donna did as she was told, and she actually went to four different stores trying to hunt down everything on Nate's list, which included leather gloves, a ski mask, and some handcuffs. In some of the letters, Donna alleged that Robert was physically abusive towards her, but there was never really any evidence to support that claim, and Donna later admitted that she had lied about that. Soon, police found out that Nate and Donna had stupidly spoken about their murder plans on the phone, on a recorded line, while Nate was in prison. On November 22nd, Donna talked about being scared that Nate would get caught. She brought up specific things like being concerned that his hair would be left at the crime scene or his fingerprints. Nate told her to leave it alone and to stop worrying about everything and said they would really have a chance to talk it all through once he was out of prison in a couple of weeks. Donna explained that she was just so nervous and Nate reassured her by saying, quote, 
The only way they can do a DNA is if they got the other person's, you know what I'm saying, if they got the person and the hair because they just can't take the hair and say, this is such and such hair. The laws that we got in the state of Ohio and the laws from everywhere else, you know what I'm saying? I mean, they are way different, end quote. He sounds like he really knows the law. (laughs) I was crystal clear on that explanation. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah, I guess he's just like, they don't have a suspect. There's nothing to compare it to. Right. He's basically, right. That's what he's getting at. He's saying, like, they can only match DNA if they have two things, you know, to compare. And once we get off this recorded (laughs) line, (laughs) right, (laughs) they might figure it out. So on December 8th, which was the day before Nate was to be released, he spoke to Donna on the phone again, and she expressed hesitation and second thoughts about what Nate was planning to do. Nate just told her, quote, I've got to do this, Donna. Police soon learned that Donna stood to gain a total of $550,000, which is closer to a million dollars today, in Robert's life insurance policies, the ones he had on himself, and she was named the beneficiary. Based on everything that was uncovered, the theory was that Donna and Nate planned to go to Donna and Robert's house and wait for Robert to get home. Then Nate would pull a gun on him, handcuff him, and forcibly take him out of the house to somewhere in Youngstown where he would execute Robert and then leave the car there. This plan did not work out the way they envisioned, so authorities believe what ended up happening was that Don let Nate into her house to wait for Robert. When he got home, Nate shot him and stole his car, then called Donna from the cell phone in Robert's car. Next, Nate abandoned the car and Donna picked him up and took him to the Days Inn where she had reserved the room for a week. Nate stayed at the hotel and Donna returned home and dialed 911 and reported that something was wrong with her husband, Robert. Meanwhile, maybe one of the crazier things in the story, and believe me, it's going to get a lot weirder. Donna didn't even tell Robert's family, including his son, that he was dead. They didn't find out for another flippin' week when the police called them and told them. That's horrible. It is. There's just, there's no reason behind this whatsoever. It's it's just, I don't know, it's just salt on a wound, really. But by the time his family even finds out about his death a week later, he's already had a funeral. He's already been buried. So they weren't even granted the opportunity to be a part of it. So upon hearing this and probably a few other things, Robert's son immediately thought that Donna was involved in his dad's murder. Donna and Nate were officially charged with Robert's murder less than two weeks later. Donna was arrested at home on December 20th, and Nate was arrested shortly thereafter at a friend's house. When he was arrested, Nate had a bandage on his left index finger. The police searched the home that he was staying in and seized a pair of tennis shoes as well as a pair of black leather gloves. The index finger on the left glove appeared to have been torn off, and there was a red substance on what was left of the finger of that glove. The pattern of the bottom of the shoes was also consistent with the tread print left in blood near Robert's body at the crime scene. Even though nobody asked him to talk on his way to the station, Nate sat in the back of the police car and denied killing anyone and asked whether or not he had the right to an attorney. The officer told him that he did and told him that Donna had snitched him out and said, you know, you can tell your story when we get down to the station. From what we can tell, we aren't really sure whether or not Donna actually implicated Nate in the murder or if that was just something the officer was saying to get a rise out of Nate. Uh, We just don't really know. But at the station, the police advised Nate of his Miranda rights. And then Nate actually initialed and signed the waiver of rights form. So he told the detectives, quote, I just didn't mean to do it, man, end quote. Then his version of the story was told, which basically was that he had shot Robert in self-defense. He's telling the police all this after he's like signed to like waive his right to shut up and get a lawyer like he he like just doesn't have to say any of this so he now is going with this self-defense story and he alleged that he and Robert actually knew each other for a few years and he had even been in Robert's home before he claimed that he had approached Robert at the bus terminal that day about getting a job keep in mind as we said he had just gotten out of prison so he says I went up to Robert at the bus terminal and wanted to find out if he could hire me to work there. So he said Robert told him to come meet him outside of a restaurant later that evening. Nate said that he picked Robert up and then Robert bought marijuana from him. And then while they were just hanging out in the car, they discussed a possible job. 
Robert agreed to let Nate come to his home to stay the night that night and said that he would start working the next day. But Nate says once they got to Robert's house, Robert started what he said disrespecting him and making racial comments towards him and just other untoward remarks. So Nate said that they actually started arguing and Robert pulled a gun and pointed it at him and he ended up shooting Nate in the finger while Nate was allegedly trying to disarm him. They continued to struggle over the gun and Nate says he ended up getting it and shooting Robert. Nate said he grabbed Robert's keys off the counter and left in his car. He said that he was really scared and didn't mean to kill Robert, so he threw the gun out the car window while driving on the freeway, and he used the cell phone in Robert's car to then call Donna and ask for a ride. He claimed that Donna had no idea what even happened to Robert, and she had absolutely nothing to do with it. Of course, the police don't believe any of this at all. Nate later claimed that he was denied the chance to speak with an attorney and filed to have his statement suppressed. At a hearing for this, he said, quote, I didn't want to speak to them unless I had an attorney around, end quote. But he said the police persisted in asking him questions against his will, even though he said at the time he was high on weed and painkillers. He said that even though he did sign the waiver to forfeit his rights, nobody actually read him his rights beforehand. The trial court overruled his request to have his statement suppressed. The whole interview had been recorded, and it was easy enough to see that Nate was lying about it. Nate and Donna were both indicted on December 28th on two counts of aggravated murder for killing Robert. Both counts carried two specifications for the death penalty, murder during an aggravated burglary and murder during an aggravated robbery. They were also indicted by a grand jury on separate counts of aggravated burglary and robbery with a firearm specification for each count. Nate and Donna would be tried separately. Nate's trial was held in October and November of 2002. Prosecutors presented the theory that he and Donna planned to murder her husband. The hundreds of letters and phone calls between Nate and Donna were submitted as evidence. Only three witnesses were called in Nate's defense, and their testimony was mainly about how Donna had most of her husband's assets in her name anyway. They were trying to undermine the financial motive for the killing that the state was asserting. Unfortunately for them, it didn't work, and Nate was found guilty of first-degree murder. Nate was eligible for the death penalty, and it was up to the jury to decide his sentence. During the penalty phase of the trial, Nate's defense brought in a clinical and forensic psychologist as their principal mitigation witness. Dr. Sandra McPherson interviewed Nate and went over his school and other records and submitted a report stating that Nate grew up with a single mom and his maternal grandmother and that his father had very little involvement in his life. She said that Nate started having serious behavioral problems as early as the first grade, and by ninth grade, he was already suspended from school because of these behavioral difficulties. Nate's school records indicated that he suffered from ADHD, which led to impulsiveness and an inability to control himself. He began using drugs and alcohol early and quickly became dependent on using marijuana, although he never did use any serious drugs. The doctor also noted that most of Nate's run-ins with the law were involving his marijuana habit. According to Dr. McPherson, Nate barely worked a day in his life and had never held a full-time job. He dropped out of school in the 11th grade and found himself living a life on the streets. By the time he met Donna, Nate had already been shot four times. There was one time, this is actually really incredibly sad. Um, His mom had to send a note to his school asking for an excused absence because the day that he missed school, it was due to her having to take him to make a police report because he had been shot. Oh my gosh. Obviously as a minor, you know, if your mom has to like write a note, like, like that's terrible. So all in all, the doctor said that Nate was really a man of average ability when you take into account his minimal education, basically saying like, yeah, he's probably a little behind academically because he didn't complete school, didn't have a great education. But other than that, like there's nothing that, you know, he's of average ability. Right. So she said that he also had an antisocial personality disorder, but did show the capacity to be loyal to people within his own group. The doctor said that Nate's relationship with Donna was very destructive, and that Nate would actually function best in a prison environment. Nate took the stand himself and said that he would like to apologize for what happened to Robert. The jury ended up deciding to recommend the death penalty, and the judge did impose the death sentence as Nate's punishment. 
and we have more to get into after one last break to hear a word from this week's sponsors. So before the break, we learned Nate's fate, and that was that he was found guilty and that he received the death penalty. So Donna's trial was held in May and June of 2003. Prosecutors really presented the same case they did in Nate's trial and said that Donna was complicit in everything, whether or not she pulled the trigger herself. They also brought up the life insurance money Donna would get in the event of Robert's death and said she hoped that she and Nate could go live happily ever after with the money. Donna's defense was that she loved her husband and she had no part in planning or carrying out his murder. Opening statement in Donna's trial were delivered by Donna herself, which I cannot tell you what a terrible idea this was <laughs> as soon as you hear the next words out of my mouth. <laughs> it's going to sound like a joke, but this is actually true. And she said, this is what I'm saying. And she went with it. She actually addressed the jury by saying, quote, good morning. Will the real Donna Roberts please stand up? <laughs> <laughs> I did Google it. The song Slim Shady, Will the Real Slim Shady Please Stand Up, did take place the year before. So it was just on her mind. It was oh my one of the biggest hits still. But wild. But I don't know that that's a good thing to do. Uh, oh, Were, gosh. Was there a fake Donna that she was worried I know, about? I know. Mistaken identity? I don't I even understand why you would start with that. <laughs> that's like me. I feel like that's like me in court with like my anxiety taking over and just saying like the most random thing I could possibly think of. Absolutely. Yeah. And then like you can't you there's no recovering from that. Once you said that, that's your first words. My goodness. But she continued. She said, quote, ladies and gentlemen, the real Donna Roberts stands before you. Again, never we were never worried about the fake one. But the testimony and evidence will establish that I played no part in Robert's death. The Donna Roberts you'll hear portrayed in the letters and on those tapes is not the real Donna Roberts, even though this is a side note from me. She's the one that wrote them and she was the one in the videos. <laughs> Back to her quote. My attorneys will test the state's evidence and ask important questions in cross-examination. Please, please listen carefully for those questions. Perhaps I'll have more to say later. You know, her attorneys were back there like, absolutely not, Donna. Please sit down. <laughs> Regardless, I am not guilty. I am not guilty. And you'll know that when the case is over. In court. <laughs> I like being spicy with the jury. I'm sure that's going to work out well. The jury, of course, was not buying this. And they ended up also finding Donna guilty of murder. So right before the penalty phase was to begin, Donna tells her lawyers that she doesn't want to present any mitigating evidence to the jury. She just wants to make an unsworn statement. The judge basically says, hey, Donna, that's crazy. Don't do that. You know, you don't put up nothing when you're fighting against the death penalty. By waiving this right to present mitigating evidence, the jury would not have much to go on in coming up with an alternative sentence. But Donna insisted she knew what she was doing. And it is the real Donna, by the way. So she, <laughs> She's she made must. that clear. <laughs> so although her own attorney did not agree with this decision, there was nothing they could do since Donna was deemed competent by a psychologist. It was thoroughly explained to Donna that she could not take back this decision if it didn't go her way. The judge ended up accepting her decision and all she presented to the jury was an unsworn statement. Oof. Yeah. So part of Donna's whole thing, just kind of her, the attitude that she took with everything was that she was refusing to beg the jury to spare her life, which typically is what people do when they're facing the death penalty. Yeah. So instead, she used her unsworn statement to fight back against things that she perceived were wrongdoings that happened during her trial. She wanted to expose witnesses for lying or for abusing their power during their testimony. One of the witnesses that she took an issue with was the bus driver who claimed that he overheard Robert telling Donna that he wasn't going to give her $3,000. So she, in court, actually berated this poor driver and put on this whole display that she was super offended that anyone would ever say that Robert wouldn't give her money. She said that she and Robert made over $200,000 a year combined, and she had everything she wanted and wouldn't ever murder anybody for money. She said, quote, I had everything. Now I have nothing. But the most important thing I don't have is Robert and my two little girls. And by little girls, she means her two little dogs. She then showed the jury a photo of these two little dogs. 
So according to a judge who later had to deal with Donna, he said that she actually seemed like she was more upset about the idea that somebody would think she needed money than she was at the fact that she was literally on trial for murder and facing the death penalty. Donna also claimed that her home had been searched illegally, and she alleged that the lead investigator actually planted evidence that they got from her home in the Days Inn hotel room. In a bold move, as if she hasn't already made many of (laughs) those. (laughs) Bolder move, I guess. Bolder move, yeah. Donna criticized the jurors. Uh, She actually called them young, inexperienced people who didn't read newspapers or watch the news. And she said... You know, you idiots, you only got like 5% <laughs> glimpse into my life. You don't know me. So she explained that the reason she wasn't presenting any mitigating evidence, duh, is so that the jury had no choice but to return with a death verdict. Okay. I haven't heard that one. <laughs> this is like a real Uno reverse. <laughs> I feel <Yeah>. like, <laughs> like, what is happening? <laughs> so she said... She said that her case and Nate's case only really differed in the fact that she was white and he was black. So now she says to the jury that because Nate had been given a death sentence, it's only the right thing for her to do to also take a death sentence because the case against them was exactly the same. So the only difference between the two of them, she says, is their race. And so because he's already had his sentence handed down it's the right thing for her to do to go ahead and let the jury have no choice but to also sentence her to death. I feel like her attorneys were saying, will the real Donna please (laughs) sit down and shut up? (laughs) Wild. So after all of this, the jury gave her what she wanted and recommended the death penalty. Yeah. And the judge imposed the death sentence. It was actually pretty unique of a situation because at this time, a woman hadn't been put on death row in Ohio since 1991, so it had been over 10 years, and still, to this day, a woman has not been executed in Ohio since 1954. So that's not where the story ends. Of course, there were appeals. Both Nate and Donna appealed their convictions. Nate's direct appeal was denied, but things go absolutely berserk when it comes to what happened in Donna's case. So in Donna's appeal, it's brought up that during the sentencing hearing, the judge was reading his sentencing opinion and imposing the death penalty. But as he's doing so, Donna's defense team happened to notice that the prosecutor is looking at a document and appeared to be reading along with the judge, which is completely out of order. According to the law, only the judge is supposed to draft the opinion. So the prosecution shouldn't have had anything to do with that document. Everyone should be hearing it for the first time. Right, right. Not <laughs> mouthing it right. along like <laughs> like you're backstage, you know, as a as a stand-in and watching the star on stage reading your lines. So at the end of the judge's reading, the defense raised an objection and the judge actually admitted that the prosecution had participated in the drafting of the opinion without the knowledge of Donna's counsel. Apparently, the judge did not have chat GBT. So the judge stated that he had given notes to the prosecutor and had instructed the prosecutor, basically, this is what I want. The judge made things worse when he added that the opinion had to be corrected six or seven oh times. Oh, my gosh. So it's not <laughs> only that, like, I had somebody do it for me. They didn't do it right, and I kept having them fix it. Wild. This is obviously a huge no-no. It's completely crazy that a judge would even involve the prosecution in drafting an opinion on whether or not a defendant should be sentenced to life or death. Because obviously it is a very biased opinion coming from the prosecution side. Their whole job is to get this (laughs) done. Just absolutely flabbergasted. So due to this massive error... The appeal court decided that Donna's sentence should be vacated and the case was remanded back to trial where Donna was to be allowed to present mitigating evidence before a new sentence was handed down. Lucky her, she finally has a chance that she absolutely scoffed away before. However, when the judge reheard Donna's case in 2007, he did not allow her to present any mitigating evidence, but instead allowed her to proffer the evidence into the record. Okay, Mandy has a note here. According to Cornell Law, a proffer is a mechanism by which a party may create an appellate record of what the evidence would have shown. Her proffer consisted of the following. First thing, Donna's prison records, which documented her bipolar disorder, depression, and an incident of hallucination. Next, a file showing a social security disability claim that Donna had filed after being injured in a 1999 car accident. 
This file also contained a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. Next, an affidavit by a psychologist who reviewed Donna's records and determined that she likely began developing bipolar disorder in childhood. Next, a letter from Donna's son talking about her character, her life prior to the murder, and a plea for her life to be spared. Furthermore, Donna stated that she herself had grown up in an abusive household where her father was verbally and physically abusive towards her mom. These fights often included a gun being brought out. And she also added that she never felt any affection or love from her parents. Donna also talked about a long history of car accidents that left her with several injuries to her head, and she claimed that it was affecting her mental health. She was actually involved in three different car accidents that were serious enough to send her to the hospital. The first one happened in 1963, and it was due to Donna falling asleep at the wheel after just being exhausted from working two jobs and not getting enough sleep. The second accident happened in 1983 when a car ran a red light and hit her, throwing her through her windshield. And in 1999, she was involved in yet another accident that totaled her car, but she actually can't remember the details of this one. After this accident, she became depressed and she tried to take her own life and ended up being put in a psychiatric ward. Donna says that at this point, she started having auditory hallucinations, but they did go away with medication. But after this accident, Donna started having falling instances, and she would fall down and hit her head often. She would lose track of what day it was, and eventually Robert made her go see a psychiatrist, and she even started getting Social Security benefits. Donna also provided examples of her selflessness and her contributions to society for the court to consider, and she stated that she was a good writer in school and that she was a creative and had a good imagination, because those things definitely mean that you can't be a murderer. Right. She said that the notes and letters to Nate were just stories, but she never intended for anything bad to happen to her husband, Robert. In the end, Donna was once again sentenced to death. After this resentencing, Robert's son, Michael, told The Vindicator that in the 40 years he'd known Donna, she had never once brought up living in an abusive home, and she also had never claimed that she had a head injury after her most recent 1999 car accident. Donna appealed her second death sentence, and it got vacated and remanded back to the trial court again. Oh my gosh. (laughs) So the reason this time is because the appealed court now ruled that the trial court didn't follow their directions on the first remand. Remember when they said you have to give Donna the chance to provide mitigating evidence, and the judge said, I'm still not going to do that. I'm going to just let her do this proffer thing. That was obviously wrong, and I don't know why the judge would do that when he was already wrong the first time. Like, you would definitely want to make sure you got it right when this case comes back over your desk again. So Nate, upon seeing that Donna is having success with getting, you know, these getting somewhere with these appeals, he decided that he would also file another appeal, and he's going to use the same grounds that Donna has filed an appeal on. They actually had the same judge, and that judge... Just like he let the prosecutor help prepare the sentencing opinion in Donna's case, guess what? He did it in Nate's case oh, also. Oh my gosh. Oh, this yeah. is consistent, I guess. Yeah. So Nate's case was also remanded back to the trial court for resentencing. He wasn't allowed to present any updated mitigating evidence, but he already had done that in his original trial. So they basically just went, you know, went with what was there. And once again, he was sentenced to death in 2012. He did appeal his new sentence again, but it was affirmed by the appeals court. And it just is truly wild to me to think about this judge because, yeah, in this case, these people have appealed or in this case, they got caught because... You know, the other attorneys happened to notice that they looked like they already knew. But how many cases did this judge involve prosecutors in making decisions like this? Like, that is truly, truly crazy to think about. Oh, and think of all the cases that could be thrown out because of that. All of them that they're, yeah, that's really, really scary. So by the time Donna's case made it back to the court for her third sentencing, that original judge had actually died. So a different judge finally took over the case. In 2014, Donna was resentenced by the new judge. She was given the death sentence once again. She appealed the decision, but this time the appeals court affirmed her sentence. In 2021, Nate filed a petition for habeas corpus relief on grounds that he wasn't able to present updated mitigating evidence at his resentencing in 2012. 
The appeal court granted his petition and remanded the case back to the trial court for another resentencing. Donna then filed a writ of habeas corpus as well, claiming in part that the trial court should have let her present additional mitigating evidence in 2014. In March of 2023, so just this year, the court ruled that they were going to wait to rule on her writ until after they've ruled on Nate's. So as of right now, Nate's writ is making its way through the system. Nate is currently on death row at the Chillicothe Correctional Institution. Donna is currently on death row at Ohio Reformatory for Women. She is the only woman on death row in Ohio. And just to end the episode with this, Robert's son, Michael, actually told the Vindicator that a lot of the unflattering accusations were made about his father during the trial, but the truth was that his father was a good man. He said, quote, he gave prisoners a job. He gave prisoners a bus ticket so they could visit their families. He didn't look down on people. He was probably the least prejudiced person on earth, Michael added. Quote, he was more than just a dead body. He was a person that people cared about. This story is truly just something. I feel like that stuff with everything that happened with her um, sentencing and her appeals, like that is truly wild and unique. That's not something that you hear all the time where a case has to be heard three times for sentencing. And because of the error, like these types of errors, like we always like to think, I feel like whenever you think about like judges and people that are in very, very high positions like that, like you do hold them to a standard of like, doing their jobs by the right. book like there things are the system is flawed as it might be and you everyone's got their opinions and I'm not definitely not saying that our justice system is perfect in any right. way but there are steps and there's like certain things that need to be done for a reason so like it is very and this is a th- this was a huge one to involve the prosecution in yeah. I mean, come on. Like, obviously, you can't do that in your final opinion about what's going to happen to somebody's life. Like, you as the judge, obviously, right. that's all on you. That's why you're the judge. So that's kind of like – that is that part was really crazy to me to even think about that. It's just those little types of situations that you don't necessarily think of, and especially people who get involved in going through the court system. Like you yeah. said, like, there are how many cases where could it actually be – have caused somebody to go – yeah, you know, that didn't if, deserve to get the death penalty or to be behind bars for life or whatever um, outcome it could be, you know, that wasn't necessarily right. I mean, just think of how many things could have gone back through the system from a defense attorney that says, oh, wait, that judge was on our case. Let's see what happened there. And now you have an appeal. So this it's just creating so much work when the judge should have just written the stupid thing himself. That's absolutely wild and like that's the whole point of him writing it himself it's the judge's opinion on this right my goodness all right so melissa are you ready to move on to last thing before we go i am mandy this week we talked about a story that took place in ohio and i decided to look up some fun facts about the great state of ohio did someone say ohio (laughs) (laughs) I would love to say we did not practice that and didn't know that was going to come. But everyone, <laughs> welcome Haley. Haley is on. <laughs> Haley's on the episode today. Thank you, Haley, for joining us. Yeah, of course. Yeah, if you were not paying attention, I bet that got your attention. <laughs> Hearing someone else's voice just chiming in <laughs> about the state of Ohio. Yeah. I mean, really. <laughs> Anytime Ohio is mentioned, I magically appear in the conversation. <laughs> What if we say it three times in a row? Do you haunt us? Oh, yeah, forever. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Well, Haley, I know you want to tell us about your new program that you're doing, but I thought first we could do a few Ohio question and answer quizzing of you two. I am going to donate $25 to our Season of Justice campaign. So either I'll donate $25, Haley, in your name, or Mandy, I'll donate it in your name. Either way, I'll donate $25, but then there's a winner. We'll have a winner. So couple quick questions for you. First question. How are we doing this? Chiming in or just raise your hand? Do you say beep? Don't say beep. <laughs> I feel like you just say the answer, right? Just and yell then it. like All right. First, Better like, hope there's no lag. Yeah. It could be mayhem. I don't know. We'll find out. We'll say one, two, three, because I want to hear how off you guys are on some of these, because that'll be fun for me. Here we go. What percentage of the United States lives within 500 miles of Columbus, Ohio? So it's a percentage of the entirety of U.S. citizens. What percentage lives within 500 miles of Columbus, Ohio? 
I'm going to say count of three because Mandy's already looking up at the sky. <laughs> One, two, three. Forty percent. Ten. <laughs> Not only did you get an extra three seconds, you went in the wrong direction there, Haley. It's actually 50 percent. Really? Well, 500 miles is a lot. So that's what I was like trying to do, like math and trying to think about you distances that math? I. <laughs> I and geography. <laughs> distances that I already know how far they are and like how much it is but 500 miles is kind of a lot so I was thinking a radius I don't know Melissa you have me over here like doing calculations <laughs> I was just thinking of the Vanessa Carlton a thousand miles and uh divided that in half and I still wouldn't have known but Haley good for you for not only buzzing in after but then going in the wrong direction point to Mandy on that one here's this one count of three you guys know this one which actress who was once married to Tom Cruise is from Ohio? One, two, three. Katie Holmes. Katie Holmes. Okay, you split it. You both got a point. Very good. The other one is from Australia. So really, that was your only option. I'm proud of you, especially Mandy. It's a good thing he hasn't had that many wives. Otherwise, I would have been in trouble. Yeah, true. Okay. Has he only been married twice? Um, actually, I think he was married to somebody else, but um, it was before Nicole came married. I was like, only two <laughs> marriages for a Hollywood star? That <laughs> seems crazy low. <laughs> it really yeah. does. I know. That's why it's easy to remember who he was married to. <laughs> I'm really proud of you both, honestly. This is just going swimmingly well. Next one. Ohio borders several states. How many do they, uh, does it border? And then whoever's closest gets to name them. So count of three <laughs> how many states is ohio border one a two three five three oh mandy good news <laughs> you got it it was five name the five states i have no clue you're gonna no, lose no. me go there. ahead give us one I really have no idea Haley, you can steal the point if you can guess okay just i like truly don't even know with a hundred percent certainty even one state that borders ohio just guess and don't say texas like, um, at least let's get in the right. Wyoming. I have to look. Um, consulting. No. Absolutely not. It's not uh, Wyoming. Pennsylvania. Kentucky. Okay. Oh, it's way, oh, it's way over Wait, there. Wait, okay, did you say so Kentucky? I, yeah. I had no idea. And then Kentucky Indiana. One, Haley. Wait. Are you oh, looking at a map? You both I think <laughs> it's, it's, and it then the other up. one is New York, I think, just like right in the corner. No, because like no New York way. is Andy, right up there steal. with Pennsylvania. So you said Kentucky? Yeah. Pennsylvania. Oh, it is five. <laughs> oh, what West Virginia. One? West Virginia. Did you say Indiana? I did say Indiana. Okay, so one more. And it has great lakes all around it. Oh. A great lake. The Great Lakes. I think Michigan from here. <laughs> did you say chicken? I said Michigan. <laughs> Michigan is right, but I thought you said chicken. Oh. So I don't know who to get that one. To. Actually, Haley, you deserve that one. Haley you named, won like, that one for thousand. sure. Yeah. yeah. And I I came right out saying I didn't even know like one single state that was anywhere But you did get Wyoming. <laughs> but that was like I was in the wrong part of the U.S. I was like on the like, opposite side of the country. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun for me as well. Okay, last question. There's a display in the Allen County Museum in Lima, Ohio. It features various objects. Some of these objects are buttons, coins, dentures, thumbtacks, and even bones. What is this display called? It starts with things, and then what's the second word? So it's things something. It's just two, two words? words. Mm -hmm. And it's an action word, I will say. Those things are kind of small, right? They're kind of small. Okay. The orifices, and this is one oh, of them. Stop it. <laughs> what are you doing with that? <laughs> okay. I'm going to give myself the point on this one. This one is, it's called Things Swallowed. Things like buttons and coins and dentures. <laughs> all stuff not... that doctors have taken out of people that they have swallowed. No way. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's weird. I definitely would not have guessed that. <laughs> <laughs> Haley's face the entire time frozen just i'm just wondering frozen. how you swallow dentures yeah me too that's like a big oh so that's the reason you guys didn't get it because of the dentures well that's... yeah oh my gosh. they yeah. have partial dentures you, you never oh, swallow that's a true. Oh, actually i've never swallowed a tooth but i guess i would just call that like a i wouldn't i, I wouldn't call that dentures and I think oh was dentures, it was it I not like... the right name you would have gotten it if it was the right name <laughs> 
<laughs> if I said partial dentures, you'd if you like, said it was like swallowed. a single tooth implant, I'd be like, okay, well, that like could be swallowed. <laughs> okay, well, I'm so <laughs> sorry. Um, either way it goes, I'm going to donate twenty five dollars to our campaign in both of your names, Haley and Mandy. Um, so please, if you haven't already, we have all the information in our show notes, and uh, we'd love for you guys to get involved as well. But Haley, before you go, we would love to hear why we actually brought you on uh, today and what you actually wanted to share before you got roped into a trivia game and hopping up saying, did you say Ohio? Yeah, so please <laughs> no one judge me based on my trivia facts of Ohio. <laughs> I'm oh. good at other things, but apparently not at knowing things about the great state of Ohio. Yes, guys, please judge Haley this week. You judge us all the time. <laughs> Give us a break. <laughs> People are screaming out if their phones. Pre- Only 10% of the population, <laughs> 500 miles. To be fair, though, where I live, um, I live in Kansas. And if you drive 500 miles like west, you're still in Kansas, pretty much. So like, mm. in my mind, I'm like, well, you're just still in Ohio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Haley, we're so excited. You've been working on this for months and months, maybe a year. I don't remember how long you've been working on it, but it's finally here tell us what's here. Yay! (laughs) What is it? So for the last year and a half almost, I have been working on a training program to teach people how to research and write for true crime podcasts like I do. And it's called true crime podcast training. That's great for Google search words. Yeah, I know, right? So we often have people write to us and say, I would love to get into researching. How does that work? And I've sent you some of those people. One of those people that ended up emailing us a couple of years ago was Anna. Yeah. And actually, that is what made me realize that I could train people. Um, so for I've been researching for podcasts for seven and a half years now. And along the way, I've worked for, of course, you guys for a really long time. Um, and then I've worked for other shows like My Favorite Murder and um, Southern Fried True Crime, Voices for Justice, like all kinds of different shows. And that just goes to show like how few people there are out there doing this that I've worked for. I've probably worked for 20 plus shows, you know, over my career, just because there are so few people and people need writers and researchers and things to help them because being a podcaster is I think way more work than it looks like, you know, there's a lot more that goes on besides just recording and, you know, so it it really does take a team, I think of people. And so that's where I come in. But over that seven and a half years, I've had lots of people ask me how to do what I do. And I was always like, I don't know. I, I got into this at the right time, um, with my own podcast and then got into doing it for other people. But then when you sent me Anna's information, she wanted to be an intern and um, I trained her from scratch and she was able to turn out work that looked like mine. And so at that moment, I was like, oh, my gosh, I guess I can actually teach people to do this. And then right around this at the same time, I went to CrimeCon last year and I met Uh, my business partner now, who's a former teacher. And so together we created the curriculum that's detailed. It's an eight week course and it's 100% online and it includes video, text and things like that. And we cover a really wide range of things between ethics and true crime, plagiarism and how that works, you know, because I think that we don't talk about that a lot with podcasting. And we also get into all the sources that I use, how I gather information, how I credit sources and things like that. And um, yeah, so it's really detailed and I'm super proud of it. It's been a year and a half of work on it. Yeah, yeah. We're like super, super proud of you, Haley, of course, because as you said, you've worked for us for a long time and you truly do just the best work. I know we're always talking about it on the show about how like we're so thankful to have Haley and so like happy that we have somebody that's able to do that. And you're so good at research and so fast at it. And it really is such like a unique thing. And I feel like it is needed to have a program or or a curriculum to for people to learn how to actually do it. Because to research specifically for podcasts, I feel like is kind of it's just such a specific thing that it makes sense that people aren't really sure how to go about getting into it and don't really understand like 
that there are like different things required because it's just a podcast versus any other type of media or something. There's like different things that you um, are looking for and that you have to put together. So I am so happy for you, so excited for you to be launching this program. I think it's awesome. So yeah, we're really uh, proud of you and very happy to share it. So hopefully word can get out there and people who are interested in it will um, look this up and take your course. Absolutely. Um, Haley, how can people get a hold of you? How can they start the course? What is, what's, give them the 411. So <laughs> everyone can go to truecrimepodcasttraining.com and there are two different courses. So you can look at the courses tab and see if one of them works better for you. One of the courses is with a coach. And so you get one-on-one -on -one coaching from either me or Andrea or one of our coaches that I've trained who've gone through the program and are seasoned in podcasting. And so we would work with you one-on-one -on -one and you get multiple coach calls and we check in and we give feedback on your work. And then at the very end, if you do everything correctly, which I think everyone would, um, we give you a certification of completion, which then you can take to podcasts and you can say like, hey, I've done this course. I'm ready to start researching for you. And also you will have your first episode researched by the time you're finished. And so you can also present that to them and say, hey. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So you can say like, this is what my research will look like and things like that. And then there's also a course for maybe people who don't want to have the coach option. And so you get all the materials, but there's just no one-on-one -on -one coaching and there's no certification. The program is really great for everyone. I think like you don't have to just be interested in researching um, for other podcasts. I think it's great if you already have your own and you just want to learn more about your researching skills. Or if you want to hire somebody to do research for you, you could send them through the course. I mean, I think there's just a lot of oh, different good. options. Yeah. I actually want to take one of your courses. Uh, I research for criminality. I only have to research one a month, but if you saw my notes, you would think I had absolutely lost my mind and was part of some sort of a beautiful mind, the whole thing. It just, there's like 28 pages of like notes I've just pulled and then I have to like pull up another screen. It's, it is not efficient whatsoever. So I'm excited to learn from you as well. And before I forget, we also set up a code for any Moms and Mysteries listeners who might be interested, and that's code MOMS, and that will get you $150 off either course. Dang, Haley, just giving out the discounts. Thank you for letting it be on our show. Yeah, Thank you. of course. Thanks for having me on. It means a lot that you'll let me come on here and talk about my stuff. And thank you so much for your kind words, of course. Well, we don't keep you locked in the basement, Haley. Jeez. I mean, <laughs> kind of. That's an option. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, I love working for you both. And they've made me promise that I'm never leaving. So... <laughs> So we'll yes. do whatever we have to do on our end to just <laughs> sweeten the pot, keep you here. We have to. Yeah. Well, I love doing the deep dive research for you both. We love you for it. <laughs> All right, guys. So that was everything for this week. We hope you enjoyed the episode. We will be back next week. Same time, same place. New story. Have a great week. Bye. Bye.